Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Equal Rights by Terry Pratchett. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. The magic just wouldn't work. I could feel it there, but it just wouldn't come out. Perhaps you were trying too hard, said Granny. Magic's like fishing. Jumping around and splashing never caught any fish. You have to be bide quiet and let it happen natural. And then everyone laughed at me. Someone even gave me a sweet. You got some profit out of the day then, said Granny. Granny, said Esk accusingly. Well, what did you expect, she said. At least they only laughed at you. Laughter don't hurt. You walked up to a chief wizard and showed off in front of everyone and only got laughed at? You're doing well, you are. Have you eaten the sweet? Esk scowled. Yes. What kind was it? Toffee. Can't abide toffee. Hmm, said Esk. I suppose you want me to get peppermint next time? Don't you sarky me, young fellow me lass. Nothing wrong with peppermint. Pass me that bowl. Another advantage of city life, Granny had discovered, was glassware. Some of the more complicated potions required apparatus which either had to be brought from the dwarves at extortionate rates, or if ordered from the nearest humble glass, human glass blower arrived in straw and usually pieces. She had tried blowing her own, and the effort always made her cough, which produced some very funny results. But the city thriving alchemy, city's thriving alchemy profession meant that there were whole shops full of glass for the buying, and a witch could always arrange bargain prices. She watched carefully as yellow steam surged along a twisty maze of tubing and eventually condensed as one large, sticky droplet. She caught it neatly at the end of a glass spoon and very carefully tipped it into a tiny glass file. Esk watched her through her tears. What's that? she asked. It's a never you mind, said Granny, sealing the file's cork with wax. A medicine? In a manner of speaking. Granny pulled her writing set toward her and selected a pen. Her tongue stuck out of the corner of her mouth as she very carefully wrote out a label, with much scratching and pausing to work out the spelling. Who's it for? Mrs. Harapeth, the glassblower's wife. Esk blew her nose. He's the one who doesn't blow much glass, isn't he? Granny looked at her over the top of the desk. What do you mean? When she was talking to you yesterday, she called him old Mr. Once a Fortnight. Hmm, said Granny. She carefully finished the sentence. Do it on pint water and one drop in his tea and be sure to wear loose clothing allow so that no visitors expected. One day, she told herself, I'm going to have to have that talk with her. The child seemed curiously dense. She had already assisted at enough births and taken the goats to old nanny and apples Billy without drawing any obvious conclusions. Granny wasn't quite certain what she should do about it, but the time never seemed appropriate to bring up the subject. She wondered whether, in her heart of hearts, she was too embarrassed. She felt like a farrier who could chew horses, cure them, rear them, and judge them, but had only the sketchiest idea about how one rode them. She pasted the label onto the file and wrapped it carefully in plain paper. Now, there is another way into the university, she said, looking sidelong at Esk, who was making a disgruntled job of making herbs in a mortar. A witch's way. Esk looked up. Granny treated herself to a thin smile and started work on another label. Writing labels was always the hard part of magic, as far as she was concerned. But I don't expect you'd be interested, she went on. It's not very glamorous. They laughed at me, Esk mumbled. Yes, you said. So you won't be wanting to try again then, I quite understand. There was a silence broken only by the scratching of Granny's pen. Eventually, Esk said, This way, hmm? It'll get me into the university. Of course, said Granny haughtily. 
I say I'd find a way, didn't I? A very good way, too. You won't have to bother with lessons. You can go all over the place. No one will notice you. You'll be invisible, really. And, well, you can really clean up. But, of course, after all that laughing, you won't be interested, will you? Pray have another cup of tea, Mrs. Weatherwax, said Mrs. Whitlow. Mistress, said Granny. Pardon? It's Mistress Weatherwax, said Granny. Three sugars, please. Mrs. Whitlow pushed the bowl towards her. Much as she looked forward to Granny's visits, it came expensive in sugar. Sugar lumps never seemed to last long around Granny. Very bad for the figure, she said, and the teeth, so I hear. I never had a figure to speak of, and my teeth take care of themselves, said Granny. It was true, more's the pity, Granny suffered from robustly healthy teeth, which she considered a big drawback and a witch. She really envied Nanny Annapple, the witch over the mountain, who managed to lose all her teeth by the time she was twenty, and had really crone credibility. It meant you ate a lot of soup, but you also got a lot of respect. And then there was warts. Without any effort, Nanny managed to get a face like a sock full of marbles, while Granny had tried every reputable wart causer and failed to raise even the obligatory nose wart. Some witches had all the luck. Hmm? she said, aware of Mrs. Whitlow's fluting. I said, said Mrs. Whitlow, that young Escarina is a real treasure, quite the little find. You keep the floor spotless. She keeps the floor spotless, spotless. No task too big, I said to her yesterday. I said, that broom of yours might well have a life of its own. And do you know what she said? I couldn't even venture a guess, said Granny weakly. She said the dust was afraid of it. Can you imagine? Yes, said Granny. Mrs. Whitlow pushed her teacup toward her and gave her an embarrassed smile. Granny sighed inwardly and squinted into the none-too-clean depths of the future. She was definitely beginning to run out of imagination. The broom whisked down the corridor, raising a great cloud of dust which, if you looked hard at it, seemed somehow to be sucked back into the broomstick. If you ever, if you looked even harder, you'd see that the broom handle had strange markings on it, which was not so much carved as clinging and somehow changed shape as you watch. But no one looked. S. sat at one of the high, deep windows and stared out over the city. She was feeling angrier than usual, so the broom attacked the dust with unusual vigor. Spiders ran desperate eight-legged dashes for safety as ancestral cobwebs disappeared into the void. In the walls, mice clung to each other, legs braced against the inside of their holes. Woodworms scra scrabbled into the ceiling beams as they were drawn inexorably backwards down their tunnels. You can really clean up, said Ask. Huh. There were some good points, she had to admit. The food was simple, but there was plenty of it, and she had a room to herself somewhere in the roof, and it was quite luxurious, because here she could lie in until 5 a.m., which to Granny's way of thinking was practically noon. The work certainly wasn't hard. She just started sweeping until the staff realized what was expected of it, and then she could amuse herself until it was finished. If anyone came, the staff would immediately lean itself nonchalant against a wall. But she wasn't learning any wizardry. She could wander into empty classrooms and look at the diagrams chalked on the board, and on the floor, too, in the more advanced classes, but the shapes were meaningless and unpleasant. They reminded Esk of the pictures in Simon's books. They looked alive. She gazed out across the rooftops of Ankh-Mor Pork and reasoned like this. Writing was only the words that people said, squeezed between layers of paper until they were fossilized. fossilized. Fossils were well known on the disc world, great spiral shells and badly constructed creatures that were left over from the time when the creator hadn't really decided what he wanted to make and was, as it were, just idly messing around with the Pleistocene. The words people said were just shadows of real things. But some things were too big to be really trapped in words, and even the words were too powerful to be completely tamed by writing. So it followed that some writing was actually trying to become things. Esk's thoughts became confused things at this point, but she was certain that the really magic words were the ones that pulsed angrily, trying to escape and become real. They didn't look very nice. But then she remembered the previous day. It had been rather odd. The university classrooms were designed to the funnel principle, 
with tears and seats polished by the bottoms of the disc's great mages. Looking precipitously down into a central area where there was a workbench, a couple of blackboards, and enough floor space for a decent-sized instructional octogram. There was a lot of dead space under the tiers, and Esk had found it a quite useful observation post, peering around between the apprentice wizard's pointy boots at the instructor. It was very restful, with the droning of the lectures drifting around over her as gently as the buzzing of the slightly zonking bees in Granny's special herb garden. They never seemed to be any practical magic. It always seemed to be just words. Wizards seemed to like words. But yesterday had been different. Esk had been sitting in the dusty room trying to do even some very simple magic when she heard the door open and boots clumped across the floor. That was surprising in itself. Esk knew the timetable, and the second-year students who normally occupied this room were down for beginner's dematerialization with Geofel the spry in the gym. Students of magic had little use for physical exercise. The gym was a large room lined with lead and rowan wood, where neophytes could work out at high magic without seriously unbalancing the universe, although not always without seriously unbalancing themselves. Magic had no mercy on the ham-fisted. Some clumsy students were lucky enough to walk out. Others were, were removed in bottles. Esk peeped between the slats. These weren't students, they were wizards. Quite high ones, to judge by their robes. And there was no mistaking the figure that climbed onto the lecturer's dais like a badly strung puppet, bumping heavily into the lectern and absent-mindedly apologizing to it. It was Simon. No one else had eyes like two raw eggs in warm water and a nose bright red from blowing. For Simon, the pollen count always went to infinity. It occurred to S that minus his general allergy to the whole of creation, and with a decent haircut and a few lessons in deportment, the boy could look quite handsome. It was an unusual thought, and she squirreled it away for future consideration. <laughs> When the wizards had settled down, Simon began to talk. He read from notes, and every time he stuttered over a word, the wizards, as one man, without being able to stop themselves, chorused it for him. After a while, a stick of chalk rose from the lectern and started to ride on the blackboard behind him. Est had picked up enough about wizard magic to know that this was an astounding achievement. Simon had been at the university for a couple of weeks, and most students hadn't mastered light levitation by the end of their second year. The little white stubs skittered and squeaked across the blackness to the accompaniment of Simon's voice. Even allowing for the stutter, he was not a very good speaker. He dropped notes. He corrected himself. He ummed and awed, and as far as Esk was concerned, he wasn't saying anything very much. Phrases filtered down to her hiding place. Basic fabric of the universe was one, and she didn't understand what that was, unless he meant denim or maybe flannelette. Mutability of the possibility matrix. She couldn't guess at all. Sometimes he seemed to be saying that nothing existed unless people thought it did, and the world was really only there at all because people kept on imagining it. But then he seemed to be saying that there were a lot of worlds, all nearly the same, and all sort of occupying the same pay place, but all separate by the thickness of a shadow, so that everything that ever could happen would have happened, would have somewhere to happen in. S could get to grips with this. She had half suspected it ever since she cleaned out the senior wizard's lavatory, or rather while the staff got on with the job while Esk examined the urinals and, with the assistance of some half-remembered details of her brothers in the tin bath in front of the fire at home, formulated her unofficial general theory of comparative anatomy. The senior wizard's lavatory was a magical place, with real running water and interesting tiles and, most importantly, two big silver mirrors fixed to opposite walls, so that someone looking into one could see themselves repeated again and again until the image was too small to see. It was S's first introduction to the idea of infinity. More to the point, she had a suspicion that one of the mirror S right on the edge of sight was waving at her. There was something disturbing about the phrases Simon used. Half the time he seemed to be saying that the world was about as real as a soap bubble or a dream. The chalk screeched its way across the board behind him. Sometimes Simon had to stop and explain symbols to the wizards, who seemed to S to be getting excited at some very silly sentences. 
Then the chalk would start again, curving around the darkness like a comet, trailing its dust behind it. The light was fading out of the sky outside. As the room grew more gloomy, the chalk words glowed and the blackboard appeared to S to not be so much dark as simply not there at all, but just a square hole cut out of the world. Simon talked on about the world being made up of tiny things whose presence could only be determined by the fact that they were not there, little spinning balls of nothingness that magic could shunt together to make stars and butterflies and diamonds. Everything was made up of emptiness. The funny thing was, he seemed to find this fascinating. Esk was only aware that the walls of the room grew as thin and insubstantial as smoke, as if the emptiness in them were expanding to swallow whatever it was that defined them as walls, and instead there was nothing but the familiar cold, empty, glittering plain and its dis distant, worn hills, and the creatures that stood as still as statues looking down. There were a lot more of them now. They seemed for all the world to be clustering like moths around a light. One important difference was that a moth's face, even close up, was as friendly as a bunny's rabbit compared to the things watching Simon. Then a servant came in to light the lamps, and the creatures vanished, turning into perfectly harmless shadows that lurked in the corners of the room.